Greetings, friends. I'm your host, Christopher O'Reilly, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to Over the Top, my new podcast celebrating the performances and life stories of musical friends, old and new. That's 15-year-old cellist Aaron Wolf playing David Popper's Hungarian Rhapsody with me at Jordan Hall in March 2009. When we performed together, then I had been longtime friends and colleagues with his parents, conductor Hugh Wolf and harpist and author Judith Kogan. I'm thrilled to be joined by Aaron Wolf today. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Chris. Now, 2009 was an auspicious year for you, uh, not only for your musical exploits, but your extra musical endeavors. Tell everybody what I'm talking about. You, you, I remember you poked fun at me for this <laughs> on the day. Um, I was, I had finished filming for the Coen Brothers film, A Serious Man, at the end of 2008, and then... Uh, it was going to be released about six months after our taping in March 2009. So it was this interim period where uh, I had this secret that some people knew, and you were one of them, and you outed me. Uh, and then and then everyone found out six months after that. But you you, st <laughs> you started the interview, I think, by saying, you know, I hate you. still feel bad about it, but I couldn't help it. I mean, be, uh, being a total Coen Brothers fanatic myself, I was so envious of you starring in such a great Oscar-nominated film. In fact, you came out to California for the award season after we appeared uh, in Jordan Hall, and a serious man, in fact, won the Robert Altman Award presented at the Independent Spirit Awards for ensemble work in the Coen Brothers' A Serious Man. What an honor. I mean, in your honor, Aaron, we watched A Serious Man again last night. Such oh, a great no, film. you didn't. <laughs> oh, totally. And such a great film. And and your your work, above all, I mean, just just phenomenal. And I'm so glad <laughs> your great ensemble cast work was honored by that very special Altman Award. Gosh. Well, yeah, I mean, it was an amazing experience. And I think that award is just as much goes towards the actual casting people as it does the cast. And I guess, yeah, it gelled really well. It was so easy. Um, and like part of the secret of that film was that they were telling their own story in a way. So they used a lot of local actors from the Twin Cities. I mean, so the, I, I've always heard it had an autobiographical aspect to it. So was was your character Danny uh, a, a amalgam of the two brothers, Joel and Ethan, or kind of? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was kind of inspired by their Hebrew school experiences loosely. I think a lot of the characters were inspired by their neighbors and their family friends. The story. The story is an original story. Yeah, they just make you feel really comfortable. So on that level, I guess there's improv because you're you're really feeling moment to moment. Um, and you try you try different things. I I never once felt like they were not pleased with what I was doing. They would always just say, "Let's how about we try this? How about we try that?" That has something to do with being 14 and not being so self conscious. I never felt like it was in the slightest uh, unsafe environment. I've always felt really welcome, and yeah, it was such an amazing opportunity, such a blast. It was. I mean, even even without the the written script, your facial expressions throughout <laughs> just stood out so much. It was just just an amazing performance. Now, uh, after soon after you won the award uh, for your solo work, actually winning first prize in the Boston Symphony Concerto Competition, which resulted in you in the solo soloing with the Boston Pops. You've obviously been 
a motivated and highly disciplined artist from a very young age. We mentioned your parents, Hugh and Judith. Uh, what role do you feel that they played in your evolution as a young musician? Well, maybe not disciplined enough to get those octaves at the end of Hungarian Rhapsody. <laughs> Music was always in the house. I think that's the starting point. And so it's like a language that you just pick up and not to be cliche, but as a way of being and moving through the world. I didn't like to practice until I was maybe late junior year of high school. And then I decided I wanted to get serious and apply to conservatory. I feel like, oh, my, my dad, I guess we're very different people in terms of our temperaments, maybe the way that our brains work, but he's always inspired me so much. Uh, he's kind of led by example. And then my mom growing up was definitely more of the instigator and the disciplinarian. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, that probably comes as no surprise. I think that's, that's, that's a pretty common dynamic. I think it really helped that they have experience in the field, but I think it also helped that, you know, they, they both went to college, um, and they both really value knowing about the world and reading and writing and the arts in general. So I never was in a kind of wake up and you better practice six hours, um, at the expense of everything else. It was right. always always finding a balance. And then they they encouraged me to go to college and not conservatory. So I was applying to, I guess, university programs with good music schools and some conservatories. And then Oberlin worked out uh, before all of them. So then I just said, okay, I'll cancel the rest of my auditions. And I ended up there, which I think was was great. Um, the, the BSO competition that you won was among the earliest of what has become a litany of awards you've garnered over your blossoming career, including honors at the Queen Elizabeth competition, the Kodai International competition, the Geneva International competition, among many others. Sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not selling that short. I mean, dozens of things. And let's not forget your being a recent recipient of the Fulbright Scholarship. Was that to study in the Netherlands? That was to study in the Netherlands um, with one of my favorite cellist inspirations, uh, Peter Wispelway. Sadly, that was the year that COVID happened. So yeah. I didn't actually go, but it was an honor to get chosen. And, you know, time caught up. I, I, I could have reapplied. Life moves on. I, I'd love to. I'd love to work with him at some other point, even if I can catch a few lessons. I did get to have a lesson with him in Munich in 2019 before I applied to that. Uh, he was judging the ARD competition at the time. And he'd done like nine hours of listening to cellists play Bach and uh, Piatti and something else. Yeah. And he was a live wire. Like it was as if he had had three cups of coffee right before he saw it. Like he's just, he just is so full of music. Uh, yeah. It was a great, it was a great lesson. <laughs> so was Peter Wispelway is, is, I mean, an all around great cellist, but were you, were you, were you going to, Initially, you know, in, in the furtherance of your concentration in Baroque music, because you've got you've won a bunch of prizes for your Bach playing as well. Um, it was it was more just as an all around. I was also going to study with a cellist named Francis Marie Witte, who was a real pioneer in experimental new music in the 60s, 70s. She worked really closely with Cortog and Bono and. Uh, I think Sherino, everybody knew her. She She's famous for developing something called the two bow technique, where you play with one bow on top of the strings and one underneath. So you oh, get four, right. four note polyphony, thinks that kind of thing up, but oh. she can do it. And she had composers. I mean, that that's a that's a big turn on for composers. So she yeah. there's a there's a, a famous piece uh, by Kurtog called Message for Francis Marie, and it's for that two bow cello and two violins and a piano. And you can also do it with two cellos. So I did that at my recital at uh, Oberlin, one of my recitals. I definitely look her up and she's still active. Uh, yes. I saw her at a concert in New York. Going back to Bach for a second, I know you spent time at that Mecca for, for Bach studies, the International Musicians Seminar at Prussia Cove, held each uh -huh. year in a remote part of Cornwall, England. I want to hear how Prussia Cove and other Bach-focused studies have, uh, have formed you substantively, but... First, I want to hear some of your gorgeous act playing. Okay. We're going to listen to the prelude from the suite number three in C major, BWV 1009.
C major prelude from suite number three, played for us by Aaron Wolf. Such a gorgeous performance, and uh, it just thank you brings up the I mean, the, the the main main kind of concept that I that I had when I went into my own Bach mania. The uh, it's a it's a Russian concept in piano pedagogy called intonation. It's not what you think. <laughs> intonation <laughs> not in terms of playing in tune or not but intonation in terms of the projection the communication of intervals so mm. so you know a half step is really best conveyed on a string instrument because you have that very intimate very close squeezed leading tone kind of feeling then mm. you have the, the the full step you know and then as you get wider and wider we get into the real vocal, the real lyric impulse of Bach. Mm. And so, so it's less about the motor thing and more about conveying the intervals, conveying the lyric impulse. Mm. It's just amazing. Mm. And, and it, it's, it, it comes out so, so naturally in your playing, Aaron. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, Bach, Bach makes it so easy because the, the shapes and the, what he's trying to convey, I think, is so clear. But then... It means that everybody does. What it means to to each individual is different because it's so clear, right? Um, it's so transparent. And it goes into everybody in their own way. So that's kind of that's how I feel the magic of Bach. Now, uh, meanwhile, I, I'm so glad to see that you continued your acting. I know you uh, when oh. you were at Oberlin, you you played the Mark Rothko lead yeah. in uh, in the, in John Logan's uh, play Red about the artist Mark Rothko. Yeah. And you've contributed writing about New York's uh, new music scene for the journal I Care If You Listen. And again, contributing to visual, visual media and another moment that I'm completely envious of, contributing string arrangements to one of my favorite shows, the old <laughs> uh, Broad City on Comedy Central. And I was just obsessed with that. Yeah, so, so what, it's, it's, it's wrapped now. They finished it. That's, yeah. That's it. Mm, that's I too th- bad. I, th- I think it's over. Yeah, you know, I think it's. I think it's done. So I've, how, at least how for did now. You come to that. How did you? Well, come to I that? mean, that that's that's really just pure chance. I don't do that much work in TV or or really that much acting stuff anymore. But my one of my friends from high school was roommates with the music supervisor on that show, and he needed a string quartet to basically double on a song uh, that was riffing off of uh, Be Our Guest. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so I got to work, and I was really excited, and I showed up, and it was all peachy, and then got to watch the <laughs> episode. You know, it's not like I have screening parties for the episode, but I, I orchestrated one with some of my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you can kind of hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what was Red like? Red was Red's an incredible play, really well written play. Just reading the script, I think, is an experience in and of itself. And that was a winter term project at Oberlin, so uh, a, a senior, I think, a theater major or she might have been an English major, was producing this two man show, um, and is very intimate. You know, it's basically in a basement studio uh, at the theater building at Oberlin. Um, which worked perfectly because the setting is an art studio and there's, there's five and they're all in the studio with Rothko and his younger assistant, Ken. And it's a lot about, it's a lot about everything. I mean, it's about art, but it's also about power relations, kind of a father son dynamic that they have a lot about tradition, the old versus the new Rothko. I guess if you don't know him, you look at his work and I mean, you feel things and you can feel quite, quite viscerally and quite deeply, I think, looking at his work. It, you wouldn't necessarily know that he had a really deep knowledge of like classic literature and um, music. Uh, we got to, so in the studio, uh, one of the props was a turntable because he's, he's, I mean, he, in the play, it's written in that he puts on music a lot. Um, and I got to pick the records. So I went to the Oberlin Conservatory Library and got like old records of uh, Mozart sonatas and uh, the slow moon of the Schubert Quintet was at one of the climactic scenes. That experience of just being in a time capsule and really 
really going for it all the way was was so cool. And when I moved to New York City, I kind of decided to focus on music. But what's exciting, my friend Anna Heflin is writing me a piece um, which has turned into kind of a one-man opera. And it's based on a book by Italo Calvino. Uh, it's a collection of short stories called The Complete uh, the complete cosmic comics. It's about an entity stuck in a void. <laughs> his and his name is literally Kufawufuka is how it's spelled. But <laughs> you're not supposed to say his name. You're not supposed to try to pronounce it. You just read it. Uh, so I won't say anything else because it's still a work in progress. But she's opening up. I think opening me up in a way that I haven't been opened up by acting. Uh, yeah. For, for quite some time and uh, getting me to stop obsessing about technical challenges and, you know, bringing a, bringing a real life character into the work. So there's, yeah, there's speaking, um, there's a little bit of movement so far, there's lying on the floor and playing potentially, um, and that'll be at Experiments in Opera in New York, um, oh. hopefully in the spring, so... That sounds um, really, really exciting. That sounds yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited about that. And as you say, you know, you, even even especially with with Red, with the John Logan play, it sounds to me like you you might recommend uh, people being familiar with the play in order to get a sense of Rothko's work. I mean, so you really get inside his 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 artist's soul through this play, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. I I played that part freshman year of college before I really had an understanding myself of what studying literature, the arts, history, how that can really affect performance and interpretation. Yeah. I mean, I, I went through Oberlin in the double degree program. I went in thinking I was going to be a theater major. Then I felt like I was in rehearsal for something every single hour of every day. So I decided I wanted to maybe be a bit more bookish. So I became a complete major and I took, you know, I took, I took classes in all the humanities and um, it was a struggle to figure out uh, what really spoke to me and how to balance my performance work because I felt like that was what I was really serious about. I think something clicked in my third year. I think I had a really good class or a really good teacher. And I realized that the things I was reading and things I was thinking about are obviously seeping into how I read music and how I express myself. I think really knowing knowing what what a composer was into and what they know and what they're thinking about um, can really just help you understand their music better. So it sounds like you've really developed a holistic approach to you know getting in the head of of all artists. I mean, and so even in the Italo Calvino's uh, uh, collection that you're, you're doing Anna Heflin's opera with, again, it seems to be very, very character driven and very deeply and meditatively character driven. Is, is that true? Um, yeah. I mean, I hope so. I, I have a, I have a little bit of a hard time sometimes when uh, discussed or explained without talking about its character where it's i mean it, it, i think it, we can under we can appreciate a composer's craft um talking about the music abstractly but um i think in terms when it comes to performance you have to go a little further um i do think that my experience in acting not, not the not the film but i took i took an acting course in new york one summer at the atlantic acting school hmm. and they they have acting technique. It's called Practical Aesthetics and is developed by David Mamet and William Macy. Oh. And it breaks down every action into four steps um, for an actor to uh, inhabit or, well, analyze, interpret, and then inhabit. And the first step is identifying what the, what the character is really doing, like what's their literal action, like, you know, they're making coffee. <laughs> and the second step is identifying what they want in the scene. Um, the third step is like, the, what they want in a more abstract way. The third step is identifying what action do they take to get what they want. The fourth step is identifying uh, an as, they call it an as if. So 
a reality from your own life as a person that allows that spurs that action on it can sound kind of dense but when you put it into practice it it makes it so that actually anybody can act yeah um because you're taking from your own life and i've always thought how can i apply this to music how can i is, is there a way to kind of bring this into chamber music or something like that i, I can do it in my own work on my own terms but to mm -hmm. actually have it be a, a a way of making music with other people in the same way that you're on stage with other people and um, you're driven by your own distinct motivations and that's what makes the art feel really alive yeah i've i've, I've always thought about that and i haven't really i haven't really come up with any answers or i'm just a bit like bashful to kind of try to put together some kind of workshop, but oh, that's always intrigued me. I, 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 I really applaud your, your idea. Well, and, and, and Macy and Mammoth's idea of combining the motivation of the character and the motivation and desire of the performer, because, you know, a, a lot of people would recommend that we lose ourselves in the character and find, you know, find the way through that way. It sounds like they're really encouraging you know, to your own input, your own juice. into it, it makes it more concrete. So that's why they call it practical aesthetics. And I yeah. think it was a bit of a rebuttal against, um, well, method acting, and I'm forgetting the, the Russian name, the Russian person's name that was attached Stanislavski. to that. Stanislavski. Stanislavski. You know, I, I, I've often thought we learn and develop as artists in a different way when we prepare for a competition. I know you've done real well in all of those. And it, well, we, 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 but we prepare in a different way for a competition than we do just yes. in the course of our formal training. You've been so successful yeah. in many of them. How do you, how do you feel about competitions in general, just as an idea? Topic. Um, I feel lucky that first of all, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to do a bunch of them. I also, I let myself develop to the point where I felt like I really want to do these. Because when you're still developing as a person and, a, and an artist, it can really get in the way. I didn't do many in a row until after my right. master's. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, 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 I feel lucky also now that I am a little bit over the hill of them um, and that I can look back and see that I really did grow through them and that now, uh, you know, I, I'm free to pursue my own projects I, the thing about competitions is that you are forced to learn certain repertoire and then everyone else is also learning that um and so you really even before you're there you feel this like pressure cooker you feel this kind of bottleneck of like i have to play this repertoire and i have to play it better than everybody else right. which i think is very very unartistic and it's very unhealthy right. yeah um what what competitions are good for is really just pushing your just pushing your playing um and kind of bringing you to a place where you didn't think you could be before um with just fluency and then ultimately confidence um but when you're doing it and like immediately after especially if you like don't make it past the first round you're like Oh my God, like, should I even do music? I have made it farther in some than others. Uh, sometimes that can sting even more because you get to the final and you, you don't make it. Um, uh, and you're like, oh, well, like what else can I possibly do? Uh, I think they're good. I think in an ideal world, they wouldn't exist and we'd have, uh, structures in place that kind of celebrate and promote individual artistry because, well, it's different when you have like, uh, it's like management uh, auditions right. Right. Um, versus just, and that's all instruments versus like one instrument all playing the same rep. Um, uh, I, I think um, the former does a better job of celebrating artistry. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time in these competitions, uh, the people who maybe offend the least uh <laughs> have the most success so yeah so then you you know to play the middle of the road i don't want to go too down too much down the rabbit hole here but i feel that uh culture is very strong today because there's so many people doing it um but i do feel that you know if you listen to recordings from the past versus now they're just it's an entirely different 
ball game in terms of individuality and personal expression. And um, yeah, I think a lot has been smoothed over and I'd like for us to, to get back. I don't want to, I don't want to say to go back to the way things were, but it sounds like the ideal world would be as, as you describe it in your theatrical work that we should, we should divine the desire of the composer of the artist and then find our own character within that. And I right. think that's, and, and of course it, it has nothing to do with playing it better than anybody else. It just has to do with your, your most intimate and full engagement with the work at hand. Yeah. I think that, absolutely. and that, that, that works for everybody. I think also it affects the way that we listen to our peers and the way that we ingest music and the value judgments that we put on it. I mean, when I was going through them, when I was, when I was at Juilliard and a little bit after, and it, it, there was a lot of interference where I was, you know, I would feel something, you know, when someone was playing, but then my brain would say, oh, but like, actually, this would be like about my own playing. Like I would right. feel things and then I would hear, you know, something went wrong and suddenly I would be jolted out of that feeling. And so right. it's taken me a long time to get back and I'm still not totally there, but to get back to listening in a way where um, you're really ingesting the the emotional character driven, yeah. um, you know, take of the piece rather than, wow, he plays he or she or they play so well. Um you know, because so many people play so well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, I think, I think there's there's a lot good to be had. There's a lot there's a lot that we can work on. Well, let's hear one of your great performances. This one was recorded at the Queen Elizabeth competition just a couple of years ago. Tell everybody what we're going to hear. This is the first movement of the Izai cello sonata, which um, I think a lot of people didn't know existed until this competition came around. And Izai had a big part in this. The, the formation of this competition. So um, they dug it up and we all had to learn the first movement.
the grave movement from the C minor solo cello sonata by Eugene Isai. That's such a great piece. My gosh, I, don't, I, don't, I know his violin stuff. I, I don't think I've ever heard solo cello music. My gosh. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to learn the rest of it at some point. <laughs> So Aaron, you've devoted a great deal of your energies in celebrating contemporary composers. We've talked about that a little bit, uh, but I know you've done workshops with 8th Blackbird and performed at Bang on Can Music Festival. Matter of fact, the last time you and I met, you brought your Oberlin Improv Ensemble into Cleveland for a club <laughs> date that I caught. Uh, that you've was got great. A beautiful, yeah. You've got a beautiful video uh, with score of Elliot Carter's figment for solo cello we wanted to play the carter for our audience but it was written in the 90s so not eligible for public domain but i want you to tell everybody where they can view all your great on online performances sure yeah i most of them are on my own youtube page um some of them you could just find by scrolling a little bit uh searching my name i'm gonna subscribe <laughs> absolutely so just you just go to go to youtube and aaron wolf yeah, it's just my name, a picture of my face, which is looking a little a little disheveled right now, but <laughs> it's it's more made up. But um, you can thank Abby Krolik for that. Yes, there you go. Yes, excellent. Shout out beautiful, to Abby Krolik. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful picture. We are able to share your wonderful performance of the Debussy Sonata, written in 1915. We're going to hear the last movement now, the finale, Anime, Léger, and Nerveux. The pianist collaborator on this performance is Derek Wang.
Brilliant performers. Brilliant performers, both of you. Really fantastic. I love that piece. You must, you must, must oh, be a favorite of yours. It's as one well. of the best. It's one of the best, and it's so fun. It's it's so programmable because it's like twelve minutes long, <laughs> um, and but it contains everything, and it's so well written. Um, and Derek, yeah, Derek's just such an amazing collaborator. So, yeah, 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 it was it was a lot of that was one of our that was one of my kind of COVID pieces, um, and we had so much time on our hands, so we really went into it. So it's great. Now, one of the things uh, you've been doing since your early teens, Aaron, is holding musical soirees. When we were on the program together, you'd invited at the time more than fifty music lovers from your high school to a tea barn at oh, your wow. house. You this described is really, it, yeah. yeah. You it's a deep a, cut. <laughs> you described a tea barn as a kind of 60s musical coffee house, only you drink tea instead of coffee while lounging on couches or sprawled out on the floor instead of sitting at tables. Mm-hmm. What makes this of particular import to our conversation today is that you not only played cello, but you also sang a few songs, accompanied yourself on acoustic guitar and cello. So I, that's been going on forever, huh? Yeah, I mean, it was a way to make friends, but also I was really inspired by musicians who didn't play classical music at that time. Um, like I said, I, I didn't want to practice super seriously until I was, you know, late in high school. And for the beginning of high school, I I wanted to be like a rock star. Like that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, to, to have that community of musicians that you really looked up to who didn't actually play the, the music that you played, I think definitely helped shape, the kind of like omnivorous attitude I have towards music now. This brings us to the artist who will close our program today, Arthur Russell. I know his music means a lot to you, and I was wholly unaware of this great artist until he brought to my attention. Give us. He was kind of a eccentric, um, cross genre uh, musician who lived in the in the East Village. Um, he lived in San Francisco. Also, he's from Iowa. Um, grew up in a pretty conservative household and then left to potentially be a Buddhist monk in San Francisco. When he re- learned he had to collectivize his cello, he then moved to New York because he wanted to do, he wanted to make make music and make art. And he became friends with Allen Ginsberg, who actually provided him with electricity because he didn't have any money to 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 pay those bills. They lived one floor apart in a building on East 10th Street, uh, 12th Street. He played in country band. He, he um, made disco music and other things. Recorded an album called World of Echo, which is basically his voice his and his cello run through an uh, echo box, which back then was just tape. And it has this amazing otherworldly sound world. And... Um, I fell in love with these songs and then also over the pandemic, um, I had an opportunity to play at a special place in Williamsburg called the City Reliquary, which houses all these New York relics. Um, so I made a kind of New York concert um, of nice. solos, solo stuff and I featured his music on it. We recorded it. And since then, it's gotten into the hands of Tom Lee, who is his boyfriend at the time. And it's become it's taken on a bit of a life of its own and... Um, I, I play his music from time to time, um, and it's just a joy. Yeah, it's something so different. That's fantastic. Well, I, I'm now going to take a moment and let my cat in. Iman, Iman wanted to hear Arthur. Yeah, cats love Arthur. <laughs> We're going to close with two of your wonderful performances of Arthur Russell's songs. Tell us about the first one, Keeping Up. Sure. Uh, a lot of his songs don't exist in one version, so Keeping Up has has a few different versions. It features all four open strings of the cello and, and tremolo, and it has this kind of upbeat, lilting feeling to it. Um, it's about keeping up with the feeling of being in love. And uh, it, it'll, it, it was my first live performance using a sampler, which you'll see, I think, in the video. So that was exciting.
makes me go keep on going when there's no wind inside happy to be you can't go slow not when it's snowing you might be back tonight Keeping Up by Arthur Russell, performed by our guest, Aaron Wolf. Just, just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so well done. Hey, now, now, was that the reliquary that we saw you performing at, or is that your apartment? <laughs> That's the reliquary. Um, yeah, you probably noticed that the canal sign. Canal- now, before we close the program with another of your great performances of Arthur Russell's music, tell everybody about the projects upcoming. I want you to remind them about Amy's opera that she's writing for you. You're excited about that. Any anything else you want to talk about? Sure. Uh, yeah. There's there's that uh, with Anna Anna Heflin. She's actually she's based in L.A. So we're trying to find work uh, time to work together. Um, and I'm playing a recital at CUNY. My first DMA recital, May twentieth. Um, that'll be in El Avash Hall, which is a beautiful hall. It's right next to the Empire State Building. If you want to go up and enjoy the sights and then come to the recital playing Arthur's music in Oberlin next week. And there are a few things here and there. Um, in July, I'm playing, uh, with eighth blackbird in New York, um, at town hall. Um, I think it's yet to be announced, but it'll be a town hall on the 17th of July and, uh, music by Philip Glass and Nika Muley. Now, and everybody can catch up and, and see your calendar of performances at what AaronWolf.com. Uh, yeah, and uh, for this next stretch, it's, it's on my social media as well. But yeah, my website's Great. always got upcoming. Perfect, perfect. We're going to close now with Aaron Wolf performing "Our Last Night Together" by Arthur Russell.
Amazing, Aaron. Just, Thanks. just beautiful. So touching. Thank you, Chris. Can't wait to uh, can't wait to hear all the great things coming up for you. It's been great, amazing reuniting with you. I'm so glad yeah, to stre- stretch out and share the wide range of your incredible work. It's it's been an honor, and don't forget to send my love to your whole wonderful family. Of course, of course, I will. And thank you for thank you for creating the time. Uh, and thank you over the top listeners for joining me today. Also special thanks to Joel Dallow, host of the Cello Sherpa podcast for the encouragement and expertise I needed to take my own show into the podcast realm. I'll see you again soon for over the top. <laughs>